the title of the track is a little bit different to what it is in the, um, in the program. Um, I call it now Beyond World Tracking. In a way, it's anyhow about uh, Beyond AR Kit and AR Core. Um, although this is a developer track, um, it's not necessarily about programming today. Um, so you will hardly find any code pieces in my presentation. I really hope that this does not disappoint you, but I think you will take something away from the talk anyhow, even if you're a developer and if your main concern is what kind of programming language and pattern you write this into. However, I'm very happy to uh, invite you to come to our booth. We can talk about JavaScript APIs. We can talk about other APIs there if you'd like. Um, also show you some demos uh, in the exhibition area. Um, I will be there for most of the afternoon. So if you want to pass by, you're more, more than welcome to see what we could do could potentially do for you. As Thomas introduced me already, I keep this very short. Uh, my name is Philip Nagele. I'm representing the company Wikitude here. Um, I have the role uh, currently as CTO, and by that I'm responsible for the product and for the technology team. Um, I have a technical background in computer system engineering. Uh, I used to work for a couple of other companies, uh, primarily in Austria and in, in the States. And I'm now with Wikitude for the past, uh, for the, for the past six and a half years. Um, today, as I said, we're going to talk about what is beyond AR Kit and AR Core. And after the 20 minutes, I hope we can, well, we, I'm going to present you two answers, uh, my personal answers to what is beyond AR Kit and AR Core, uh, everyone uh, is talking about. Don't expect this to be a rant about AR Kit and AR Core. You could expect that a competitor or a, a company doing this for several years is now ranting about Apple and Google and how bad the technology is. It's the very contradictory, or the very opposite to that, actually. I think ARKit and ARCore are very good technologies, um, very well executed, but in a way a little bit limited, and that's what we're going to uh, explore upon. Uh, but I'm far away from um, ranting about Google and Apple. And uh, if you have seen one of my talks from Santa Clara, I usually uh, have a quiz involved, and I'm uh, playing on the fact that we could do this from Salzburg, so it's not too far away from here. Um, and I have a few quiz questions about Salzburg and giving away Mozartkugeln. As I thought, Munich is so close, I'm not giving away Mozartkugeln today, um, so, but I'm rather diving into it. And I'm trying to um, come to the point what is beyond AR kit and AR core um, through what I think is really important for AR experiences. And when I say AR today in this talk, I use this term synonymously for mixed reality, so. I don't really differentiate, and I think it's uh, between AR and MR. I think it's more an academic uh, discussion here. And um, so let's explore what I think really matters for an AR experience. And I'm not talking about what separates the bad from the good AR experiences. I'm talking about what is, I think, really the minimum requirement for an AR experience. And for that, I had a look at um, how um, one single service or one single experience is executed on several platforms or front-ends. DigiCapital calls that the four waves of, of computing. And I have three waves here, the desktop or the internet area, um, the mobile area, and the augmented reality area. And I've chosen Google Maps because this is one of the services um, that has, a, has one service uh, deployed for all of them. Note though, the augmented reality view of, of Google Maps, this is, one of, is a shot from of one of the very first promotion videos of Google Glass. And everyone who wore Google Glass Let's, let's try that. Who, who used to try Google Glass actively? 5%, 10%, maybe? Well, it's not that lot. So those 5% know out of effect that the user interface was not like this one. Uh, but I think it's possible that an AR implementation of Google Maps could look roughly like that. And what I wanted to do is compare those three front ends, or the three implementations of the very, very same service um, based on two two KPIs or two indicators. One is information density. And with information density, I mean how much information is packed into this service at, the given, at any given moment. And I think it's quite obvious that um, for desktop, um, the information density is pretty high. Google Maps offers many options on the desktop. You have a huge screen real estate. The user interface options are manifold. So the user is expected or is, is getting a lot of information there. On mobile, this story is already quite different, right? Because of limited screen real estate, uh, because of limited interaction with the screen, 
there's not, there are not so many options. The UI is reduced. So the information that we can present to the user, or in this uh, aspect Google is presenting to the user, is already, a, let, already let, uh, a lot limited, even stricter in augmented reality. The information you can show, um, given the screen, is even less. Interaction is somewhat bulky. So the information we can deliver at the very given moment for the experience is getting slower. The second KPI I want to kind of uh, highlight here is what is the context this uh, experience is delivered in. Um, and when I say context is how much do we know about the person using this service at the moment. Um, and in a desktop environment or an internet environment, we hardly know anything about the user. If we're lucky, we know the person because he logged in, but we don't actually know whether this is the person using it. Um, we know a location based on an IP address, which is huge. We really don't know what the user is currently doing, so we don't know a lot. Um, for mobile, again, a little bit different. We know more. We have more sensors. The mobile phone has more sensors. We have a tendency, or mobile phones tend to be very personal devices, um, so the likelihood that the person owning this phone is using it is very high. And this is even higher with augmented reality. Um, particularly for glasses, we know where the person is looking at. We know a lot about the context and the environment as such. And if you hypothetically add those two up and say, okay, this is the relevance, I'm, I'm delivering um, the experience. I think uh, the sum for augmented reality is a lot higher than for desktop. Of course, this is a hypothesis. Um, you know, maybe someone can prove that mathematically or through um, in, um, studies. Um, but I think this is really the case for augmented reality. And if you look close, the main dominating factor here is really context. Uh, if we don't have context, I think an AR experience doesn't really make sense. So let's look at a few examples how they use context, uh, or how well they use context. Um, and uh, this is one of the examples, uh, or the first example I'm starting. That's probably the only slide I have where I'm actually ranting about Apple. I think this demo uh, where they showed off ARKit and the demo of ARKit, from an AR experience perspective, was really not good. Um, in the example they were showing this game, uh, the person on the right hand side is placing the game on the table, moving around and then interacting with the game. Um, so now ask yourself, what is the context? How does this game make use of the surrounding of the user? It doesn't. It doesn't really matter which plane or which surface this, is this game is on. It doesn't matter whether this is this table structure or whether this is at your home does not at all obey or uh, deduct any information from the surrounding. Um, think of the exact same game, um, not as an augmented reality game, but user interface would be you control the environment with your hands and swipe gestures. Is there any considerable difference? I don't think so. I think this game will actually make harder for people to play it. Um, so if you play this game for 15 minutes and running around your table all the time, why should I do this? I don't see any, any reason to do that. The technology used, as many of you know, is ARKit. ARKit is a, a visual inertial odometry system, uh, that meaning the device is being tracked in real time in the space, uh, plus some uh, basic plane detection. The technology itself is not the limiting factor here, I think. Um, because if you look at this example from one of our customers, uh, Sadak, um, they're using the Wikidata, or they use the Wikidata SDK to place furniture there. Um, it's a very same technology. We call it instant tracking. It's also a um, six degree of freedom tracker. Uh, it's the very same technology. Uh, but the point here is that I'm building context. I'm outsourcing this context to the user. I'm giving the user the power to place the furniture in his home, and by that I have additional context. So in, in this way, uh, the same technology, but with a very much different uh, ability for context. Look at Pokemon Go. Um, Pokemon Go, I think it's uh, common knowledge, uses GeoAR or sensors, Geo sensors and GPS sensors um, to locate yourself and then you go to the Pokestops and you can uh, uh, grab the Pokemons. Um, this uh, experience and this screenshot is a very poor man's wizard trick in a way. Um, it has nothing to do uh, with the reality there. The Pokemon sits there um, in, in your field of view but does not interact with your surrounding at all. Pokemon the application itself has no knowledge what this is. Think of Pokemon Go if it could really interact with the Pokestops, right? If a, Pokemon, if a Pokestop would be a statue or a wall 
and the application would have a sense of that this is a statue, or this is a wall, and the Pokemon would come around and interact with the physical environment, that would be a whole different game, right? I think this is also not a very well execution of context in, in AR space. Um, different story here, although this is a very old example, uh, the technology stack used is a, totally uh, is identical. It's an application for um, a platform, a sightseeing platform in London, um, where we infer and uh, add context and knowledge what a user is currently looking at. This works pretty well, right? So the illusion here is a lot better uh, than what Pokemon Go is. Um, again, same technology stack. And the question is, where do we get context from, or where can we get additional context from? One of the things is we can get context and information by knowing what the user is actually looking at. Um, and in this example, um, this is an um, image recognition example. The application is a companion app to a book of RT or very special uh, satellite images. So it's kind of an art book that you don't want to mess around, so you cannot put additional information in the book itself. There's a companion app, so if you scan each of the pages, um, they would show you additional content. Very often with satellite images, people want to know or guess what is this city? What is, it, what is this actually? And um, the context we need here is which page is the user currently looking at? This is something you would not be able to do with the R kit at the moment. Uh, but there's also some additional information I know about the user, in this con about the context the user is currently in, that I can deliver content. Same is true for Snapchat. Uh, different techni uh, technical uh, stack there, though. Um, face recognition and face detection, but the idea here or the context I'm getting is a lot more, right? I have context about, oh, the application is looking at a face or is even looking at my face, so I can place content perspectively correctly uh, in here. Same story about objects. Um, we're not living in a 2D world, we're living in an object world. If I can display information at a particular object, if I know the user is looking at this very object at the moment, um, or at this piece of machinery, we can show the user a lot more information that are useful and relevant. So if you think back about, uh, if you think back um, on my slide, um, all we want to reach is relevance, right? Uh, if something is relevant, this generates um, benefit, this generates value. Other thing that helps us uh, in, in, in creating context or getting context information is depth information, is the information about the surrounding. Um, and here the example of Tango scanning the environment and building a map of my surrounding. This is super helpful, right? If I know how my surrounding looks exactly and if I can transfer that to the digital world um, and use that in my digital experience, that makes uh, things a lot easier. And um, I'm citing here Matt Misnick's, um, uh in one of his recent blog posts uh, where he said, there is no point building an AR app unless it interacts with the physical world in the same way. And if you replace interact with the physical world and makes use of the context the user is around, we have the exact same argument. I think this is really one of the things uh, very important for the AR experiences. If they don't build up on the context of the user, don't do it. Put them in, in VR, make them a, a non-AR experience. If there is no context, if you don't use the context, if you don't interact with the physical world, there is no sense in doing AR or an AR application. And I expect that we will see many, many, many AR kit, AR core applications uh, that are kind of fun applications that not at all respect that you interact with the physical world. Um, just recently saw an NBA game where you can uh, throw virtual basketballs into a basket. Why? Why? Um, of course, there is some fun element to it, but this is not sustainable. This is, this is a gimmick. Uh, if you do one-offs and kind of want to create laughter, that's fine. Um, but it's not the idea of AR experience or where the power of AR really lies. Going a step back um, on looking kind of what generic components uh, in AR, MR, VR system are made of, um, I think I identified those four here. Um, it's really a sensing component. So a component in a system that has sensors that gets information from the outside world, gyroscope, accelerometer, a GPS sensor, barometers, microphones, cameras, whatever we have on our on the device. This is the input for a computing engine, our compute engine, algorithms that work with this information and make something workable out of it. This is then hand handed over to a visualization component. So um, something uh, typically a rendering engine um, that uses the information from the comput uh, computation power or from the computation engine. That is an output onto a projection 
uh, whatever that is. They are selling that. So why I'm showing this to you? Um, because I think, um, or usually the left hand side is very hardware driven, the right hand side is very software driven. Why I'm showing you this is because I think it's a pretty good guide to identify where we currently are, where ARKit sits, and to identify what's beyond, right? If I want to know what's beyond, I need to kind of, first of all, even slam like, know where I am. Um, and I think it's a pretty good guide. Um, so let's look in this kind of, in this framework where ARKit and ARCore sit and what they do for each of the components. For the sensing component, then I'm leaving off, I'm leaving out gyroscope, accelerometers, kind of the standard, well, I mean the meanwhile standard um, uh, components. Uh, Air kit and core using mono cameras, stereo cameras, uh, HDR cameras, and depth cameras. On the computing side, and I've split the computing side into two parts. One is kind of tracking, so knowing where the device is and where it's moving. The second part is kind of not sensing, but understanding the surrounding. Um, ARKit and both Encore use uh, an approach called Tensor Fusion and um, SLAM or VAIO, um, which has been a pretty hard or pretty tough um, computer vision problem and, and computer <coughs> engineering problem for the past years. And it's no, by no surprise that Apple brought that out and also Google brought that out on their Pixel phones early on because they have a tremendous benefit that they know the hardware by heart. They can control that. And that's a tremendous advantage. Um, if you're into um, sensor fusion or working with IMUs, you know, um, knowing the parameters, the intrinsics and intrinsics <coughs> of such a device or such a system is key to any success. If you don't have that, you have a hard time uh, succeeding. So on the, on the surrounding, get, getting an understanding of my surrounding, uh, Apple is delivering us this plane detection, a very basic plane detection uh, mechanism where we can identify multiple horizontal planes, no walls though, no vertical planes. On the visualization front, um, we get lag-free rendering, high-quality rendering, high-quality 3D models. Uh, we get a physics engine through Unreal and through Unity <coughs> that we can work with and can employ for AR. And on the projection part, we have a smartphone display, pretty much. Um, now this is tailored to AR kit and AR core, but there is more to it, right? And we wanted to know and answer ourselves where, what is beyond AR kit or even before AR kit. So on the sensing area, and this is uh, pure speculation of myself, um, we might get radar sensors, we might get leader sensors, so laser uh, detection ranging sensors on our phones later on, particularly to get a better picture of our surrounding. On the computing side, there is already a lot more and there will be more. Um, so on the computing side, what we had before with uh, Pokemon Go, location-based tracking using GPS as one of the sensors. Marker-based tracking, and with marker-based tracking, I mean everything that has kind of a predefined structure. I'm not only saying fiducial markers. This can be natural feature images. This can be objects, anything that's kind of predefined. Monocular vision slam um, as a pre-step to sensor fusion slam. Um, we're seeing in the research papers areas of dense slam so that each and every pixel is actually calculated and not just a few uh, feature points. And something you might have heard already today, and you, I guess you might want to hear today and tomorrow uh, more on, is the AR cloud. So kind of a global slam, a global system that has uh, point clouds and uh, reference maps of each of our surroundings. Um, I think this is a huge step, but we see Google with VPS doing the first steps here. Um, but it's something we might, we, we, we might see afterwards. And on the computing side, on the getting to know my surrounding, there is still a lot out there. Um, as I said before, what we currently can do is recognize predefined uh, images and objects. Um, we see currently deployed recognizing predefined shapes. Uh, so it doesn't have to be the exact texture in there. It's enough if uh, I have a, a predefined shape and the object fits there. I said plane detection, but this is still very basic. Um, this will go afterwards, or this will go to that we understand any arbitrary objects, um, not just predefined shapes, but any kind of objects. Um, I think we as developers, we will have a full mesh of our surrounding that we can work with. We probably want to, will understand also the material of certain objects. You know, if I want to interact with my reality, it's actually quite important whether I have a solid wall or whether I have a, a, a bed there, uh, and whether a ball bounces off a wall or a, some, a soft material segmentation of objects in the experience that I know which part uh, is what and also a semantical um, 
understanding of the scene. Those are the things that will still come and will help developers, will help you to make AR experiences uh, a lot better in, or use, uh, have a better understanding of the context of the user. Also the same on the visualization front. I think there is still a lot to come. Um, artificial motion blur to make uh, the rendering more realistic and adapted to your uh, seeing. Atmospheric as uh, as effect, particularly if outdoor, if you're playing outdoor, um, you know the atmosphere itself has a big say on how we uh, experience real objects. And one of the things I think is the holy grail for uh, visualization. I call it adaptive light rendering, um, meaning the virtual content adapts to the current light situation in this very moment. Um, and this is, I think, very very hard to tackle. And whoever gets that right. Um, will have a big advantage here. Uh, but visualization or, um, is not only limited to visual information, also our ears. Spatial coded sound, I think, is something that we already see in VR deployed. This will make also a, a, um, an interesting if, uh, difference in AR. Also tactile feedback, um, uh, some things that we get in terms of the output. And for the projection, I think it's, it's uh, anyhow kind of clear or a little bit more obvious what, where we're going. HMDs, smart glasses, untethered, full of uh, full uh, field of view glasses. We might want to end up with smart lenses that we insert in our eyes and get the digital information projected right here. Um, or we'll have something like a brain bridge um, that will inject the information directly into our brain. Again, this is pure speculation. So coming to what is beyond AR kit and AR core, and my answer to that is, I think it will be many more possibilities that you as developer can build upon the context of the user to build AR and, and mixed reality experiences. And this will come through various technologies. And in some, in some of those technologies are already here. As I said, image recognition, image tracking, object recognition, object tracking, identifying particular objects that is already here available and you can use it. And um, looking at my time, um, I'm probably rushing the next one or the second answer to what's next. If you look at the current situation, and this image is lacking um, AR glasses or smartphones or HoloLenses, um, our world is made of, of different form factors, right? Some of us using, using Android, some of us using iOS, some we're using tablets, we're using smartphones, we will use smart glasses, we will use HoloLenses. So there's a multitude of devices out there. And I think uh, while we see those deployed now, ARKit deployed to a certain set of devices, HoloLens runs on a very niche set of devices. Um, AR Core runs a set niche uh, of devices. I think AR and also VR have some social aspect to it that will make it a lot, interest, a lot more interesting. And um, what's beyond there is also that we need to bridge those different devices and different uh, operating systems. Coming back to my initial argument on context, one of the things we can do is we can share context. We can remotely share my context, my surrounding with someone else. Like in this uh, example, um, the worker here shares his context, his view uh, with someone remote, an expert remote. Um, here we already have two very different devices, even two different front ends. One is wearing glasses, the other one is uh, working on a, on a desktop. Um, or if you think of games, uh, this is a, actually a graphic from I think 2012 from one of the research papers. Um, not from us, um, where you have different modes, so you have persons who are not physically here but have the same context as the rest of the family. And putting that kind of into extreme is what Microsoft showed with holoportation, which I think is a very interesting aspect. It's still far away, I think, or it's still some, some time away to deploy that in a mass market. But the idea here that I can share my context and bring that to some different place is very, very interesting. In this context, what is beyond AR kit and AR core? I think it's share and collaborate on augmented reality and mixed, ex mixed reality experiences cross-platform, cross-tracker, and also cross-frontends, so different ways of it. Um, so I think there are many, many exciting things beyond ARKit that already are there and that we all can work with, um, but it will make AR a lot more interesting. So thanks a lot um, for your attention. As I said, I can only invite you if you want to do some follow-ups to our booth or afterwards. And with that, I hand over to Thomas. Okay.